All right, Rod Sellers, UConn, great joining us. Thanks for uh, hopping on the podcast today. Oh, my pleasure, man, my pleasure. <laughs> so Rod, I always love to start with this question when I'm talking to former <laughs> UConn players. A, what drew you to UConn? And B, at your time, when you joined UConn, UConn wasn't what UConn is today. So what was that recruiting pitch like to you at that time from Coach Calhoun to come up to UConn? Well, uh, I was, I wasn't heavily recruited, but I was recruited, you know, nicely. I'm from South Carolina. I was recruited in the Southeast pretty well. But what, you know, intrigued me about UConn was one, first was my brother was close by and me and my brother are very close. He went to Central Connecticut and we're very close. And then I was a chance to play in the Big East. And, you know, at that time, the Big East was, uh, it was brutal, you know, Georgetown, Syracuse, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was a brutal conference. And, you know, I was, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't heavily recruited. A lot of people had doubts about me. So I wanted to, I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to show that I could play at certain levels and that I could, you know, play at UConn. So I went to visit and I remember Lyman the Priest was the guy who took me around, you know, took me out my host. And, uh, Think about, I like about Lyman. He was just an honest guy. He was, you know, he was, you know, Lyman was just tough. He was honest. And he told me everything, you know, he could possibly tell me about Coach Calhoun. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, he just said, you know, Rod, he's like, man, Coach is rough, man. <laughs> it's not going to, it's not going to be like this easy. And I, and, you know, I, I love, I've always loved the challenge. I love the challenge. And I said, oh, yeah, I said, I, I appreciate that lie. And so I came up there and, uh, he, he didn't tell a lie. It was <laughs> Coach Calhoun was not easy, man. But I mean, it was a great four years. I, I had an outstanding time. It was it was awesome. I, I've heard of some of the, some of the fun practice stories from a Coach Calhoun <laughs> practice. What was your first practice like under him? Uh, did you give me second thoughts there? <laughs> I, I, I remember my first practice, and leading up to the first practice, I remember you know my freshman year was Cliff Robinson and Phil Gamble. They were seniors, mm-hmm. so. You know, we would do like, you know, the unofficial practices and, you know, play ball. And then we would run, you know, do the running up the cemetery hill up and down. And I just remember all of them saying they were, they were like basically instilling fear in us. It was like, oh my God, you guys, man, you guys are going to make it, man. Practice is going to be a beast. Oh, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. And I just remember it like they, they were saying that. And I was like, good Lord, how rough can practice be? Now, I came from a coach who in high school, we would practice four hours. You know, I remember my first practice in high school with this coach, he put 32 minutes on the clock and we had to run up and down, just sprints for the 32 minutes. And then after that, we practiced. I'm like, all right, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. So we go to practice again. You know, I'm like, I I can't, you know, I'm this guy. I can never show a sign of weakness. I can't be weak. You know, right. Make it, make it through. Don't let them see that you're tired. And I remember we started in Geyer gym and before before we even went to the field house, we started in Geyer. And I remember like 20 minutes in, 30 minutes in, this guy's over there throwing up. I'm like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, this is nuts. And we go, man, and we, I mean, it was intense. It was hard. It was everything those guys had said, you know, but I made it through and I was like, all right, here we go. Let's go. But it, it, man, it was definitely intense. <laughs> what was it like then going from those practices and, and finally getting into the game? So were, were the games in some sense easier than the practice itself? <laughs> Here's the thing, you know, late eighties, early nineties, the Big East was a war. Every game was a war. So, you know, we practiced basically preparing us for war. And, and some games you go in and, you know, it, it, the games would be easier. But in general, the games were so tough, so brutal. Like, I would leave games and I would have bruises on my arms. And, you know, it was just, it was, it was rough because, you know, you ratchet up your intensity level, you know, a little bit for the game. But the practice has definitely prepared you for the games. When it comes to the Big East, you talk about how tough it was, you know, getting beat up. Who was the toughest opponent in the Big East to go up against when you were there? I, I always said it was different teams, different players for certain reasons. So the toughest team for me to play against was Georgetown. You know, Alonzo Mourning, mm-hmm. I still say this to this day, was the strongest guy I ever played against. He was he was brutal. They had Alonzo Mourning at uh, 
what's the guy named JT Turner, mm-hmm. John Turner, and they had the Kimbe. So that was the toughest team for a big guy to play against. But the most physical game for me was Pittsburgh. Like, I just, I don't know, playing Pittsburgh with Brian Shorter and Bobby Martin and Morningstar. I mean, that game was the game where you would come and you would feel all your bumps and bruises, that game, because it was just a war, that game. Now, Providence was a different because it was so close. It was like a rival that I remember Coach D used to always say before every game, before every game we played, I would say 40 minutes, give them 40 minutes. Whenever we played Providence, he would always say 40 minutes, maybe even 45. And because we went to overtime a few times with them, it was just, it was just that, that rivalry, whatever. The most skilled team in the Big East to me was Syracuse. You know, they had mm-hmm. Derek Coleman, Davey Thompson, Billy Owens, Sherman Douglas. They just had talent. But they, they weren't as physical as like the Pittsburgh or the Georgetown, but they were really skilled. Who had the toughest crowd in the Big East? Because I know the Big East, along with, you know, being tough in terms of players, some of the crowds could be pretty rough on the road. Oh, my God. <laughs> for me, now, I, I'm sure everyone had a different crowd that tough. But for me, it was uh, St. John's. You know, like the New Yorkers, man. They just, they didn't care. I, I remember my freshman year, uh, we were playing, and Cliff Robinson is shooting a free throw, and I'm on the line, you know, trying to get in for the rebound. And the fans are right there, and they're just, like, screaming some of the things. I'm like, Jesus Christ, these guys. <laughs> like, oh, these guys don't care. I mean, it was – it was some, I can't even say some of the things they were saying, but it was just so brutal. I was like, wow. And, you know, freshman year, again, this is when I learned that – you know, I remember Cliff telling me this, because Cliff taught me a lot. He's – so you got you to gotta be able to tune it out. You got to be able to just focus on the game. You hear the noise, but you don't hear the words. I remember he would always like preach that. You you hear the noise because you feed off the noise, but you don't hear the words, what they're saying, because it can get, like they can get really personal. (laughs) When it came to, I think probably one of the more memorable parts of your UConn career is that dream season run that you guys were on. How long into that season did you guys realize that, that you had something special going on? You know, I, this season, we, we just spoke about this season not long ago, this same team. Yeah. And I remember the very first game we played, uh, well, one of the first games, we played in a Great Alaskan shootout. And we got beat in the first game by Texas A&M. And I was like, oh, boy. And then, you know, we, we went on, we won two games after that. I'm like, oh, we pretty, we all right. We, we played some non-conference teams and we, we did okay. We lost to Villanova and we lost to uh, St. John's by 30. Oh, oh, man. And then something clicked. I don't know. I think, you know, we got everybody back helped. I think Scott and I missed a couple of games. We were trying to work the rotations, and the Dove started playing into the rotation. And then everything clicked. And that's when you saw, like, the press really take off. The press took off. You know, I said Smitty was, like, he could score. You know, Scott was probably the greatest athlete that I've ever seen. The Dove had a great feel for the game. His basketball IQ was insane. And I remember, uh, you had Lyman as tough as nails. You had Murray, who would, could do a little bit of everything. You had John Gwynn, who was instant offense off the bench. And I always say this about Tate George. Tate had this confidence about him that we kind of fed off. He had like this, almost like an arrogance. Like he knew we were good. Even when we weren't good yet, Tate had this arrogance like he knew it. And we kind of fed off of that. And I was like, wow. So I would say, I remember we were in practice one day and we had won, we had just won like seven games in a row in the Big East. And coach gave this talk. He said, you know, about the next game, whatever. And he would always end it with, okay, you know, we, we may lose, but we're never going to like get out played or whatever. And then he, after this talk, he said, well, we may not lose <laughs> because we're playing so well. And everybody was like, yeah, we're not losing. And it was just crazy. We just like went on this run that was like insane, man. It was that was an incredible season. For sure. Well, while you mentioned uh Tate George, I've got to ask about the game where, where Tate hits the shot that that's gone down in, in UConn lore. What was that like from your perspective being there? This game, I never forget, you know, we're playing Clemson. You know, I want to play Clemson because it's my home state, you right, know. Yeah. And I was actually recruited by them, but I had a bum knee. 
So I didn't, I wasn't going to get a lot of minutes, you know, but I wanted to play so bad. And I remember at one point we were, we were being up big, like 17 and 19 or something. We were up big. And then, you know, it's like we got complacent. We stopped attacking. And they just came back, came back, started coming back, cut the lead, cut the lead. And I remember they get up on one. I'm like, and we fouled. They got a free throw. I'm like, oh, my God. And uh, I remember they, they shoot the free throw. I don't remember who shot it. They missed. Scott grabbed the rebound. And as he's grabbing the rebound, he's calling timeout. And so we go to the bench. So, you know, coach put the shooters in. He has Scott on the base. I remember him drawing up the play. And he, he asked Tate if he can catch it. Tate, can you catch it? He said, Scott, can you get it to him? Scott said, I'll get it to him. He said, can you catch it? So he told us what to do. Now, the, the play originally was designed for Smitty. Smitty was supposed to cut like across like the half court line, catch it in rhythm and in, in, in motion. One dribble, quick shot. Tate was the second option. But Smitty didn't move too well. Scott wanted to get, you know, closer to the basket. And he threw a perfect pass. And Tate sealed the guy off perfectly. Yeah. And I remember watching it. And I'm leaning. <laughs> and, you know, we're all on the bench leaning. And he, she was, he gets the shot off, like, almost uncontested because the guy didn't want to foul. And we're all leaning. And it goes in. And it was euphoria. We just went insane on the bench, man. It was it was all over the court, we're grabbing each other, ah, screaming. I mean, that was like insane. That that feeling is even hard to like, you know, recreate. But when you think about it, you still get chills about that. That's how good it was. For sure. I, I, I can only imagine. I, I've got to ask <laughs> about uh, some other fun uh, that went on in the NCAA tournament, especially when I've got you. And that that's going up against those Duke teams in uh, – Leitner in particular, how tough was it going up against him in, uh, in those matchups? So this is what I always I tell people to, the, to this day. You know, I, after college, I played 14 years in, uh, in Europe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I played against some really tremendous athletes in, uh, in college. I played against the number one pick, the number two pick, the number three pick in the 92 draft. I would say Shaq probably was the you know, Shaq was Shaq, the yeah. greatest Alonzo was the strongest I've ever played against. I would say Christian Leitner was the most skilled guy, the best, the best all-around player that I ever played against. He was 6'11". He could shoot. He could post. He could pass. He had a great basketball IQ, and he had an edge to him. He had this edge to him that, like, made him nasty. And that just, like, kind of, like, elevated him, you know, to this level. Yeah. And... I mean, this guy, he used his body well, and he, he was good. What, what frustrated me about him was he was so good, but he was, he was also dirty. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, that good. You don't have to be dirty. So, like, playing against him, you'll get a cheap shot here or a cheap shot there. I'm like, come on, man. You're like, play out a year. Why are you doing the cheap shot things, you know? And it just it drove me crazy because he was that good, but he was that, like, you know, a little nastiness here and there. Like, come on, man. So you know, I got to the point where I just got fed up with it and <laughs> a loose ball on the ground and I see him and I just dive on his head, you know, just to get like, oh, I was just fed up with all the cheap shots. Yeah. But he he, he, was, he was good. Extremely talented, hard to play, hard to defend. He was good. When, you, when you're down on the floor tangling with him a bit, were you surprised the refs didn't call anything and just kind of let things go there? <laughs> You know, like, I, before it happened, he hit me with a, a vicious elbow, like, right here. And I remember I was bleeding, and I went to the bench, and I was, I was sitting beside Oliver Macklin, and I asked him, I said, you know, we call Oliver Macklin, me. I said, me, who hit me? Because I didn't even know who hit me. That's how, how bad it was. And I was like, you know, I was a little dizzy. In hindsight, 2020, I, I had a concussion, but that was back then. You know, they didn't do the same. They just put the little thing under your nose and smell it. And yeah. so I said, me, who hit me? He said, man, Leighton, I got you good. Like, Damn. So a couple of minutes go by, a coach comes down and says, so, you ready to go back in? I'm like, yeah. You know, I'm still like woozy. But I, I, I get back in. And it's like, as soon as I get in, you know, Smitty and Hurley are on the floor for a loose ball. And I see Leighton jump down there. And I, at this time, I just kind of lose it. I just jump on him. I don't even care about the ball. I just jump on him. And when the whistle didn't blow for a 
a foul on me. I'm like, oh man, I got away with it. <laughs> and, and I thought I, I literally thought I got away with it until after the game, we're back in the hotel and I call my mom after the game and she says, what's wrong with you? Are you all right? I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, you hit that man in the head. You look like you had the devil in you. I'm like, what? She said, yeah, they kept replanting on TV. I'm like, oh, they caught me. <laughs> so I didn't even know I was caught until, you know, after I spoke to my mom. Yeah. How, how did it work? Because I've, I've read that you had to issue an apology to Coach K. How did that come about? So the, the thing was, uh, it came up the next year. So my senior year. I wasn't suspended in the regular season, but I was going to be suspended for the first NCAA tournament game mm -hmm. because of what happened the previous year. So, you know, we talked about it, you know, at UConn athletic director, uh, coach, coach D and they said, well, if you issue an apology, it's an apology to coach K, you know, maybe he'll say it's okay. And maybe you won't be suspended. So I, I was like, all right. Now at the time, I'm I'm still frustrated because he hit me, but nothing yeah. happened to him. So you know, I got but I got to do what's best for the team. So I issued the apology, thinking that you know, NCAA's wouldn't suspend me, but they still suspended me. <laughs> they they always find a way to get you right. Oh yeah, they got me. <laughs> <laughs> I know you mentioned earlier playing overseas. What was that experience like, and, and how different is the game playing it overseas in some of the countries you were in? The the, uh, the international game is well, – that experience was great. Let me say that. That experience was awesome. You know, I was 14 years, I speak five different languages. You know, they treat you like a god over there. So, you know, I used to tell people, man, it's like I'm in a shack over here. You know, that's how they treated me. Literally, they treated me like a god. Yeah. I had a great run. But, you know, I will always say this. Like, I remember a few years ago, Luka Doncic came to the NBA, and he said that, it's easier to score in the NBA than it is overseas. Mm -hmm. And people thought he was crazy, but it's true. And in, in, in the NBA, it's, it's more open and spread out. It's, uh, you know, no hand checking rule. You know, they cut a lot of the physicality out. Overseas, it was a lot more physical. You know, they could play zone. They could, zone, they could load up on you. You know, you can get knocked upside down and they wouldn't even call a foul sometimes. So the Big East prepared me for that. But, you know, it, it was it was great, you know. And when I was over there, I used to tell my brother all the time, I said, Pat, I said, you know, the, the difference in Europe is the uh, the European four man is basically an NBA three man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said that the four man shoots threes. You know, he, he shoots threes like crazy. I said, it's almost like one, one and four out. And... <laughs> When I came back, when I retired, I remember I was talking to Coach Lato, who was at University of Virginia at the time, but, you know, he was an assistant at UConn. Yeah. And I was telling him, I said, yo, I said, the, the NBA game, the American game, college game, will soon mirror the NBA game. I said, they're going to have the, the, the pick and pop or the stretch four or the stretch five. They're going to have that over here soon because at the time, you know, it was like the four was just like the five man almost. Like, you know, the Knicks had Oakland and Ewing. They were both in the paint. They even had Mate, Anthony Mason playing the three. Yeah. It was like everybody was in the paint. I said, trust me, the game is going to change. And he was like, nah, Rod, right. I don't think so. I don't think so. And you look at it now, it's just like I, I predicted. But the game, it's uh, it's the four man in Europe. Well, now, you know, all of them, the four, the five, everybody could shoot the three. Yeah. When I was over there, everybody would uh, work on every position. So the five man would do all of the guard drills and the guards would do all of the big man drills. So everybody had all of the skills. That's why, you know, also you see the European guys, they're very skilled. They may not be the most athletic, but they're very skilled. How did the coaches over there compare to Coach Calhoun? You're not going to get a Coach Calhoun. You're not going to get that. You know, that, that was not even close. Coach was, you know, Coach was a great I would say this, Coach Calhoun had a way of, of making you want to run through a wall for him. Mm -hmm. now, he would get on you. He would he would bring the best out of you, you know. He just made you tough. He made you, like, hard-nosed. He made you a competitor. You competed for everything. 
And, you know, I'm 50 years old and I'm still that same way. Yeah. I compete at everything. Like my wife hates playing card <laughs> games with me because I'm, <laughs> I'm always competing. But that's just how, you know, you just, that's how you were. I had some really good coaches in Europe. You know, mm -hmm. like I had some really good coaches. They were really technical here and there. But I didn't have a coach Calhoun who called us basically every name under the sun. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he, he was like a, a dad to a lot of us, man. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we all love that guy. You, you talk about wanting to run through a wall for him. And, and that's one thing as a fan that I loved about watching Coach Calhoun was seeing him out on the court, seeing him go after the refs. What was it like from your perspective, sitting on the bench maybe or being out on the court and you <laughs> see him going off at a ref or what? What's that like? You knew Coach Calhoun had your back. So you knew no matter, you know, you could make a mistake and he's going to scream at you or whatever, fuss at you, but you knew that he had your back. So with that being said, you made sure that he knew that you was going to do whatever you could for him. Mm -hmm. So that's why, like, those guys, man, all of us would just, like, basically run through a wall. We would go do whatever we had to do for that guy because just how he was wired. Mm -hmm. He kind of, like, put that on us for us to be wired that way as well. Like, I remember this. Like, after the Leitner incident, you know, I was called, you know, thug, bad, all of this by a lot of, you know, radio stations or whatever. Mm -hmm. One thing Coach did was anybody who ever spoke badly of me, he would not go on their radio station. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't He wouldn't talk to them. And I was like, wow. But that's just how he, he always had our back. So that's why, you know, I, I always had, I would always do whatever I could for Coach Calhoun, man. I just a great, just a great guy. Are you surprised he's still coaching? Did you think he'd throw on the towel or were you surprised to see him get back in it? I was not surprised at all. I, I was surprised he was able to walk away because of how competitive he is. Like, you know, I I heard his wife basically had to push him out the door. Miss Calhoun had to be like, you know, Jim, get out of here. You're killing me. Because he's so competitive. Like, how how could he? I could never understand how you can tone that down yeah. and how he was, you know, like at such a high level for so long, yeah. you know, and I mean, I couldn't, I just couldn't understand how he was able to walk away. And when he came back, I said, yeah, I knew it was going to be, I knew it was going to happen, you know? What was it like, you know, having played and really been kind of the foundation for UConn to then see the program take off, see him start to win championships uh, and see the the four that they've won to date so far? And that, that's great. That's a great feeling for all of us, especially, you know, our class, our generation, you know, the, the we always call ourselves the foundation. Mm -hmm. So to see the foundation that we built and then see it built up so nicely and so strongly, I mean, we take great pride in that, you know, and I, I follow UConn today, just like I'm still playing, you know, UConn can go on my wife. Like, I can't go anywhere. No, no. Game's on or whatever. <laughs> After the game's off, we can do some things, but you know, that's how it is today, you know, and you know, the group that I was with, we we're in like a group text. We still text a lot. We talk a lot or whatever. Sometimes we'll we'll be on a group Zoom call. But, uh, you know, they're up there. So when their fans allow, they can go to games, you know, here and there. Yeah. So I don't really get to go to a lot of games. So when I do get to go, you know, I'm excited and thrilled, you know, and I can feel the electricity still running through, you know, running through your body, you know. But to see what they've accomplished is like, it's amazing. Yeah. How, how big is it? Do you think that, that they're back in the big East back to, to where they were when you were there playing? Oh, that's huge. You know, I, uh, I, I couldn't understand the American conference. I have nothing bad to say against yeah. the American conference, you know, but I just couldn't understand geographically how that benefited UConn. You know, UConn is a, a big East school. It's a Northeast staple and they recruit heavily in that area. And just the conference itself speaks names, speaks volumes. So it helps with recruiting. You know, the American people were like unsure. They didn't yeah. know. So I, I thought I thought that hurt recruiting a lot. I think being back in the Big East, having the familiarity, having the, uh, the rivalries back, I think that helps a lot with recruiting. <clears throat> I think that helps UConn's image a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think we, felt we, we faded a little bit these past seven years in the American conference, even though we got a national championship there, I still think, you know, it hurt us a little bit, not, not being in the big East. I'm not saying, I'm not going to say being in America. I'm saying yeah. not being in the big East, not being home. Mm -hmm. I think being back is huge for us. 
Have you gotten the chance to interact with Coach Harley at all, or in, you know, your thoughts on, on the direction of the program, you know, heading into the future? I love Danny. You know, uh, we played against each other when he was in college. And when I was up there, it was a 2018 for uh, the Calhoun event. You know, I, 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 talk, I, spoke, I spoke to him a lot then, but I think what he's doing is great. You know, he's bringing that same intensity, that same energy back, you know, and you know, the UConn fan base, man, yeah. you know, they're nuts. So they, they, they're loving that, they're loving that energy and, uh, and just the, the direction that Hurley had the program going. And he's doing so well on the, on the recruiting trail as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's huge for us. Absolutely, Rod. Uh, really appreciate the time. Thanks so much for coming on. I uh, really enjoyed looking back at, at your career with you today. It was a lot of fun. Uh, man, Jared, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. Feel Absolutely. free to reach out anytime, man. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks again. All right. Have All a good right. one. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.